This is our first service broadcasting from the church family, and uh, no matter what, there's always a few things that we need to work out, and uh, the microphone just decided to take the day off, and so we've got another one, and we are ready to go. I want you to know that as we gather here this morning, we are doing what we were asked to do, and that is to he 
keep our distance. As a matter of fact, I've come prepared to make sure that happens. So, Brother Rufus, I want you to know, I've got you over here. Brother Jason, I've got you over here. And so, we're keeping our distance. And we do know that for the next few weeks, uh, we are going to be coming to you by Facebook, YouTube, and it's going to be a while yet before our church family can get back together, and we are so looking forward to that. But for now, we understand what the guidelines are, and we are going to abide by those. And having said that, the first couple of Sundays we came to you, I had an open collar. Last Sunday, I had a shirt and tie. Today, I've got a suit and tie. I've got to get back in my comfort zone. And we're going to move on with our lives. We're going to worship, and we're just going to celebrate God's goodness in the midst of a difficult and trying time. And the message today will focus on the cross of Christ. The message next Sunday will focus on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the message the week after that will focus on what the Lord wants us to learn through these weeks and days that we have experienced. And I hope that you'll be praying. I hope that your heart will be prepared because we cannot afford to miss the lessons that God wants us to learn uh, through this experience. It's not been a necessarily pleasant one. Many things in life are not. But even and especially in those times, we can learn from the message that our Lord is sharing with us. This morning, I want to share a scripture with you, a very familiar scripture, surrounding the cross of Christ and the crucifixion of Christ. That scripture is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23. And I would ask, uh, start with verse 39, and just... Share with me as I read these precious words. One of the male factors, or criminals, which were hanged, railed on him, saying, If you be Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answered, rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, seeing you are in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing amiss. And he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said to him, Verily I say to you, Today shall you be with me in paradise. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. Bow with me as we pray. Precious Father and loving Lord, it is good to be in a time of worship. We know that can take place anywhere, anytime. But this morning, you've called us to a special time because this is a different time in our country. Indeed, it is a different time in the world. And we know that people's emotions are running the complete cycle from fear to anxiety, the uncertainty of not knowing what a day may bring. But we rest in the peace of knowing that our life and times are in your hands. And while we do not know what tomorrow may hold, we know who holds tomorrow. And Lord, we have come to worship you and celebrate the goodness and the grace of our Lord. And as we come this morning, we open this word, and it's God's word, it's a good word, it's your word for us. And so, may our hearts be open as the book that lies before us, and may we be ready to receive and to hear and to respond at the appointed time in the appropriate way. Whatever is done, We'll give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus' loving name, amen. 
people join us as we sing one of the old familiar songs. You can't get much more familiar than this, the old rugged cross. this morning, 
the Rufus Curtis, the Jason Dye, Michael Yeltsin, and the Billy Dotson. And our audio and sound technician is Andy Burris. And our congregation this morning is my wife, Carol, and Andy's wife, Teresa, and Paul. And so, won't be much question about who I'm talking to this morning. So we are honored that we've been able to come here and to our church family this morning. Just want you to know we so much miss you and look forward to the day that we can get back together and worship as a family. Welcome Jason this morning as he comes to share a message that someone has requested and and uh, he has prepared to share that message this morning in song. It's called Before the Hammers Could Ring. Before the hammers could ring, his blood touched the cross.
Thank you, Jason. When we last met as a church family, shared a message about the events leading up to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, I think it was important for us to know the sequence of events beginning with Luke chapter 22. It all started by Judas selling his soul to the devil and selling out Jesus Christ for 30 pieces of silver. He did exactly what Jesus said he would do. In that time, our Lord shared in that last supper with his disciples. We know that Peter did exactly what the Lord said he would do. Before the rooster crowed, Peter chickened out. And even in spite of his boast that he would never deny the Lord, he would never forsake him. We know that as our blessed Lord prayed in that garden of Gethsemane, the soldiers came, about 600 of them, to arrest him. And we now find our blessed Lord on the cross of Calvary. But he's not alone on that cross for a lot of reasons. First of all, there's a howling mob on the ground. All of the people from all backgrounds. Some of them are there perhaps out of curiosity. Some of them are there because they want to see this man pay the ultimate price for what they considered was the ultimate sin. Some of them were there, no doubt, because they just happened to be at that place at that particular time. But there were two others who were there, and it wasn't by accident. They were the two who were nailed to the cross on either side of our blessed Lord. We don't really know a lot about these men, but human nature being what it is, there are questions that I have about them. How old were they when they started their life of crime? How old were they when they got caught? What was their method of operation? Did they lie in wait by the side of the road? After all, the word thieves means they were bandits. That's really what they did. The other part of it is, how long did they continue in that life? How long did they continue? If doing everything they knew was wrong. The other question I have is, how did they get caught? What dead end street did they go down one day when they met their match? I wonder, did they even have a trial? Did they have any trial at all? And if it was, was it any more appropriate than the one our blessed Lord had? because what he went through was a kangaroo court by any definition. But nonetheless, here they are. And I have to wonder, is their mom in that congregation? Is she in that crowd? Is their mother out there watching their son pay for their deeds, or more specifically, for their misdeeds? I wonder, are they brothers? Did they come, just come to know each other? Did they even know each other? Did they even meet each other before they were nailed to that cross? But none of those answers really matter. But what happens on that cross does matter. It's interesting because we know from Matthew's Gospel that both of them were railing on the Lord. They were just letting him have it. We don't really know why. We really don't know what they knew about Jesus Christ before that fateful moment. But for whatever reason, maybe they were just joining the crowd. Maybe they were just got caught up in the emotions of the people who were cursing and spitting and yelling and just doing everything they could and saying everything they could think of to degrade our precious Lord. But on that cross, even as they got into a verbal battle with Jesus Christ. And by the way, it was probably a one-way battle because the Lord of all people, of all time, 
well, I'm not going to argue with them. But on that cross, all of a sudden, the two of them just quit arguing with each other. And their anger and their resentment is pointed toward the Lord. At least one of them is. And now they go at each other. One of them makes a statement, Lord, would you remember me? Would you come down from this cross and get us down from this cross? His request was a very logical request. Just get us down from this cross. The question that comes to my mind is, and I don't know if the Lord asked him this, but I certainly would have understood if he did. Why do you want to get down? Are you planning to go back to the lifestyle that got you here in the first place? What do you plan to do if you were to get down from here? Which, by the way, brings me to another question that I could ask the people of the world today. You are so intent on getting through this crisis, and I can understand that. We all want to get through it. We want to be done with it. But my question is, and maybe you've prayed to the Lord, and you've asked him to just cease this whole business. My question is, why are you asking him? Why do you want to get through this? What are you planning to do when all this is just a distant memory? You know, one of the precious things about that scripture is, our Lord did not honor that man's request. And I'll tell you why it is precious. Hill, he could have done it, no doubt about it. He could have come down from that cross. He could have called 10,000 angels, and they would have rescued him in a moment. And make no mistake about it, there were more than 10,000 angels waiting for that call, waiting for that word. And they would have been there, and they would have delivered him. And Jesus Christ would have come down. And I'm telling you, there would have been a celebration like you have never seen when he came down from that cross. There would have been hallelujahs. There would have been praise gods. And Mount Calvary would have been called Miracle Mountain. And if that had happened, I'll tell you the tragedy of it all. You and I would be forever lost. We would still be in our sin because Jesus Christ had chosen one last time to yield to Satan's tempt. And by the way, that really was Satan's attempt to get through that thief, that bandit, and get our Lord down off of that cross one last time. Let's go at it one last time. Let's tell him. Get us all down from here. Let us all be spared from this pain. The Lord did not do that. The Lord did not do that. So there's one on the right, and then there's one on the left. The one on the left has another request, but it doesn't have anything to do with getting down from the cross. It just has something to do with something that's going on in his heart. I don't know what he saw. I don't know what he heard in the three hours that they had been there. But he obviously saw something. He heard something. Maybe it wasn't what Jesus said. Maybe it's what he didn't say. But our blessed Lord had the ability, he always did, to have an impact, to have an influence on people who were around him. And the bandit on that cross was no different. And over a period of time, he just saw something. I don't know what he knew about the Lord before that day. I don't know what he had heard about him. I don't know if he even knew why Jesus was being crucified. Probably did. How could he not? But he doesn't have any request about getting down from here and getting back to my old lifestyle. What he's saying is, Lord, I don't want to get down from here. I want to get up from here. And I don't want to go back to my old lifestyle. 
I want to go to my new lifestyle. And so he asked him a question. Just a rip, just a plea that comes from his heart. Lord, would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? By the way, that man was the only man who called Jesus Lord. And because he called Jesus Lord, the Lord would know right then there's something different about this man's heart. Or he would know his heart anyway. But when he said Lord, he proved on the outside what was on the inside. And he, all he was just asking was, Lord, I don't really know where things are going to go from here. But obviously there's something different about you. And all of this talk about a kingdom and all of this talk about you being king. Lord, would you just remember me when you come into your kingdom? And the Lord's answer to that man carried absolute tons of weight. Each and every word he said has to be taken in its own context and weighed out and listen to what he said. First of all, his answer was, today, today, that's the first thing the Lord said to that man. Today, do you mean something is actually going to happen? All this man was asking is, Lord, out there somewhere, sometime, somehow, will you remember me? And the Lord said, don't worry about sometime, somehow, somewhere. Today, something's going to happen in your life. And you are going to be amazed. Let me tell you what the Lord did when he said today. First of all, he put an end to all of this stuff. And I just call it stuff about being saved by works. That man cannot go back and change one day of his life. He's not going to set foot on this earth again. He cannot go back and give anybody a cup of cold water. He cannot go back and help anybody who has fallen among thieves. And Lord, he would know about people who have fallen among thieves. Lying by the side of the road, he's not going to have that opportunity. He can't change anything. And without question, the Lord made a statement that day, absolutely, you are going to be saved today, today. And you are going to be saved not by your works because you're never going to have a chance to get any, do any. You're going to save, be saved by your faith in me. Today, right now, I'm telling you, if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, he's telling you today is the acceptable time. Now is the appointed hour. There's no reason to put it off. There's only danger and death in delay. Then he said something else to him. Today, you, one man, and as far as we know, the only man, Whoever called him Lord that day was that thief on the cross. And as far as we know, the only man who got saved that day was the thief on the cross. I want to be very clear about something. On the day of Pentecost, 3,000 souls were saved. Boy, what a blessing that must have been. But I'm telling you, I don't care if it's 3,000 or three million. Jesus Christ still deals with people one on one. Each and every person has to make a personal commitment to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, accepting Christ as your Savior is a personal matter. It's between you and the Lord. And I want you to know today, if you got any idea about getting into the presence of the Lord one day, by any other means, it's not going to work. If you're planning on going <coughs> piggy tail, 
on your grandma, you better be thinking again because it's not going to happen. Here's the beauty of it. Nobody can make that decision for you. Nobody can make it for you. The other side of it is nobody can stop you from making it. And so that man took sole responsibility for his relationship with the Lord. And the Lord took full responsibility for that man's eternity. Today, you shall be. Listen, the Lord, when he said shall be, did not leave any gray area whatsoever. There wasn't a bit of fog in what he said. There wasn't any way to misunderstand this. He let him know absolutely, positively, without a doubt. And by the way, the first word our Lord said to this man in response to his request was, Verily. When he said that, what he really meant, and what he really said to that man was in the shadow of what the other man had asked him, why don't you get down from this cross today and save yourself and us? And by the way, the emphasis was on us. You do what you want. You just save us. But when the Lord answered this man and said, verily, he answered that man's request to come down from that cross. He said to that man that day, you can count on me. I will not let you down. I will not fail you. If I were not going through with this, it would have all ended in the Garden of Gethsemane. It would have all been over when I got on my knees and prayed. And God did I ever pray. I prayed until sweat drops of blood came from my forehead. And I asked my Heavenly Father, if there is any other way, let it happen. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And we settled this matter in the Garden of Gethsemane. We settled it right there. On my knees, when I made a commitment, I said, I'm going through with it, and I am going through with it. I will not fail you. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Absolute, positively, no doubt about it. You can take that to the bank. <laughs> Better than yet, you can take it to heaven. And I'm here today to tell you, as far as we know, that was the only man who called Jesus Christ Lord that day. He's the only man who had the assurance that his eternity was going to be with the Lord. But you know what? It just seems like the Lord always saves the best for last, does he not? When he told that man that day, today, right now, you shall be, no doubt about it, positively, absolutely, count on it. You shall be with me in paradise. Wherever that man could have gone, he would never in eternity have found a better place. With me, with me today, let me tell you, every person who goes out of this world goes to be with the Lord. Let me correct that. Every believer who goes out of this world goes to be with the Lord. And I want you to know that we talk about where we're going to serve the Lord in heaven and on and on it goes. But you know what the Lord really wants? He wants you and me to come up and be with him. In his last earthly prayer, priestly prayer before he left this earth, in John chapter 17, he prayed, Father, I would that they might come up and be with me where I am. You may find this strange, but every time a believer goes out of this world, the scripture is very clear. The prayer that Jesus offered that day is being answered because a believer is going home to be with the Lord. And I'm telling you, when Jesus Christ said that, 
He put an end to all of this stuff about purgatory. He put an end to all of this heresy about the sleep of the dead. Today, you shall be with me. You're going to be with me. Absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Make no mistake about it. He had something else. He had something special. He had something precious for this man. He said, you are going to be with me in paradise. There's only three times in the New Testament where the word paradise is used. One is the scripture. The other is Revelation chapter 2, verse 7. And the other is like 2 Corinthians 12, verse 4. But every time the word paradise is used, it refers to heaven. And so, I want you to know, people ask the question, Pastor, where is paradise? Very simple. It's wherever Jesus is. It's wherever he is. And let's face it. All of us are looking forward to heaven for a lot of different reasons. We are looking forward to being united once again with our loved ones. Oh, how we long to be with them. We are looking forward to being free from all of this pain, all of this sickness. By the way, I just had a pleasant thought this week. I want to share it with you. In this last year or longer, We've had some precious people gone home to be with the Lord. Our heart grieves for the, the absence that we feel and the void that we feel in our heart. Some of them are members of a church family. We miss them so much, so much. Some of them are members of our personal family, and our hearts are broken when we think about them. But with all that's going on in the world today, I want to tell you there's a message that our loved ones who are with the Lord would tell us this morning. Here it is. There's no virus where we are. This because the former things have passed away. All things are made new. No more sickness, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more death, no more crying. And Jesus said to this man, that's where you're going to be. That morning, that man's feet were walking the stone floor of a dark dungeon. If there was any floor at all, maybe it was just the damp, cold earth. But his feet were walking in that dungeon of a prison. By nightfall, that man is walking the golden streets of heaven. Has that for a change in fortune? And all because he asked the Lord, will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? And I believe the Lord would say to him, will I remember you? Listen, all that man asked for was, Lord, will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? You know, Jesus always gives us more than we ask, does he not? That man got a whole lot more than he asked for because all he wanted was to be remembered somewhere, sometime, somehow. Jesus said today, you shall be with me in paradise. That's a pretty good change of fortune, if you must say so. When I look at the scripture, I realize that Jesus Christ gave his life. He gave his heart in order that we might have eternal life. And I'm telling you that each and every person will have to whisper this same prayer. Maybe not the same words, but the heart of it has to be the same. You have to call him Lord. You have to ask him to be your Savior. 
You have to ask him to take you. And you have to do what this man did. He trusted Christ as his Savior. There are people today who say, well, Pastor, I'm going to do that when I get my life in order. I want you to know that unless and until you do that, your life will never be in order because your priorities are all mixed up and all messed up to start with. And there are those, God forbid, who would say, well, Pastor, I'm going to do what that man did. I'm going to enjoy my life. And on my deathbed, I'm going to ask Christ to come into my heart. You talking about risky business, you're giving risky business a new meaning if you're planning on doing that. And I'll tell you why. Because you don't know that you're going to get that opportunity on your deathbed. You don't know that you're going to have time to do anything or say anything to anybody. All you know is that one day you will be taken home from this world. And where your home is then depends on what you do now. But there's something else I need to tell you. And we need to set this straight. We need to set it straight. When people say, well, I'm going to do what that man did. I'm going to accept Christ as my Lord on my deathbed. Let me tell you, that man, as far as we know, did not take the last chance he had. As far as we know, he took the first chance he had. He was there in the presence of the Lord. I don't know if he had ever heard of him before. I don't know if he saw him, if he knew anything about him. But something about Jesus on that cross changed his heart within a span of about three hours. And three hours on the cross that changed his heart changed his home for all of eternity. And one day, we're going to see him, and we're going to talk to him, and we're going to ask him, tell me about that. Tell me what it was that convinced you to ask the Lord what many people would consider a ridiculous question. By the way, with all that howling mob down there, and boy, they were howling. They were screaming, they were cussing, they were spitting, they were doing everything. How in the world did our blessed Lord hear that man? I don't care if they were just feet apart. How did our blessed Lord hear that man when he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom? I'll tell you how. Because the whisper, and I don't care if the man spoke in a whisper. I don't know what he did. But the whisper of one man coming to the Lord in repentance, he will hear over the shouts of a thousand who are yelling at him in rebellion. And Jesus Christ heard the whisper of a man today who asked to be saved, who asked to be a child of God. And if you'll whisper that today, if you'll just whisper to the Lord, I promise you, I guarantee you, he'll hear you and he'll come into your heart and your life on earth and your life beyond earth will forever be different, forever better. And you will be so glad, you'll be so glad that you did what he did. And you didn't wait until your dying breath to do it either. You do it now while you, because today is the acceptable time. I'm asking you this morning, as we, as a church family, you join us at home, our worship team will come. We're going to sing a song that is just one of my very favorite. Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for everyone, and there's a cross for me.
especially do I want you to listen to the words of the fourth verse of this song. But each week in our service here at the church, Mount Carmel, we offer an invitation, and we certainly are not going to fail to do that today. And so this is my invitation to you today who are joining us by Facebook, by YouTube, no matter where you are, in your home, no matter if you listen to this live or if you are listening to a delayed broadcast, it doesn't matter. But this is my invitation to you. And by the way, I want you to know that this invitation comes to you on behalf of my Lord. The scripture says we are ambassadors for Christ. He could not be here personally this morning. So he sent me here to ask you to give your heart to him. This is the invitation. We said at the outset, we don't really know very much about either one of these men other than they were bandits, they were thieves. And somehow their lifestyle caught up with them. You see, that day, things changed so dramatically for one man. You see, two men died that day along with our Lord. One man died a believer. One man died a blasphemer. One man went to paradise. Another man went to perdition. One man was concerned about being free from his suffering. Another man was concerned about being free from his sin. One man was concentrating all about self. The other's concentration was wholly devoted on the Savior. I guess you could say we don't know the name of either one of these two men. Yes, we do. Maybe this is a stretch, but I want to make it fit this morning. The man who asked the Lord that day to remember him when he came to his kingdom, the man who got more than he asked for, the man who heard our blessed Lord say that day, today you shall be with me in paradise. His name was whosoever. So what? What did you say, Pastor? I said his name was whosoever. Because the scripture says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Our blessed Lord said that he has come to give us salvation, and one day he's coming to take us home. As the scripture says, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Boy, what a transfer, what a transformation. And all because that man, all I know is he counted himself to be among the whosoevers. And he asked the Lord to come into his heart. He said, Lord, remember me, remember me. And if you will ask that today, you can be assured Jesus will not ever fail you. He will not fail you. And so this song, where you are in your home, it does not matter. Wherever you're listening, just ask you to bow your knee. Better yet, just bow your heart before the Lord and just say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart as we sing. Will you give your heart to the Lord?
morning has been a blessing to you. We are able to do things differently being back uh, in uh, a church house. But nonetheless, we still miss our people and we pray God blessings on you wherever you are. And just pray that the service today will help you to face whatever life may be bringing. It's not just about what's going on in the world today. It's anything that may be going on in your life. Because Jesus Christ made a difference in one man's life. And he can make a difference in your life also. We wish God best for you this week. I know he wants his best for you because he gave his son that you might have that. Father, today in Jesus' loving name, we thank you for this scripture. For this, thank you for including this in the holy book. And thank you this morning for setting it apart and just allowing us to look into these words and see how this man's life could be used to change our life. How what happened to him can happen to millions of others if they'll just ask the Lord what he asked. And remind us today that Jesus is always willing, far more willing to give than we are to receive. And he always gives far more than we ask for. So thank you that we go this week in Jesus' name rejoicing because, as the psalmist said, whom have I in heaven but thee? In Jesus' name we ask it. God be the glory. God be the glory. Amen. Amen.